In this video, my friends Jim Bergman, Bill Spohn, and Kimberly Llewellyn talk about electrification, which we all admit is a bit of a buzzword, but it is something that is happening more and more rapidly as we go away from gas appliances to heat pumps and other electric technologies. And this presentation uh, is short. I wish we would have made it a little bit longer, but it was actually one of my favorites uh, of the entire symposium. They make some, some really great points that I think need to be heard by the industry, which is why I'm sharing it here on YouTube. So here we go. Electrification at the 2023 HVACR Symposium brought to you by ACA and MeasureQuick. I, I always like to say electrification is not like flipping a switch. It's okay to laugh. Uh, but, but it's not going to happen all at once. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen everywhere all at once. But it is a trend. I noticed a couple nights ago, I saw my news feed that Shell Oil Company had bought an elect electric car charging network called Volta. And the CEO of Shell Oil said, the conversion to electric vehicles is inevitable. So society is moving in this direction where you know, either you, you can get on board or, or watch it happen uh, in the background. So Brian very kindly gave me the opportunity to use HVAC school and several other channels that, that we had access to, to offer to contractors the ability to participate in this survey. So we targeted HVAC and home performance contractors because that's a belief that, that I have. And I share with uh, John Hohen, who's actually here from a company called Duckling that's at the very earliest stages of inception. And I'm a strategic advisor to them. So because of my, um, he found me because of what I was doing with my house, all electric house, and, and all the, the, the kind of benefits and issues that we had there. So some of you may have taken part in either the survey by clicking on a few links or an interview. How many people did the survey? OK. Thank you. And how many people did the interview? So, so several of you are represented. Your, your feedback, we were just looking for feedback. So 30, 101 people were surveyed. This is a set of survey questions that we gave. I'm not going to go through this all in detail. We'll make the slides available. But it's just questions about, are your customers asking about it? Are you ready to do it? Do you want to engage? And how do you want to engage with it? So it was just, we weren't pushing any agenda, but just finding out what's going on. So we had 101 survey respondents. We actually you know, looked at some demographics of age, their role in the organization. Were they serving primarily residential? How many were already installing heat pumps? Because that's a large part of what electrification seems to mean to people and to the public. We, look, we were able to collect through this you know, network a pretty broad survey across the country and even into Canada. The awareness seemed to be pretty high. People have heard of it. 87% of contractors have heard of it. And how frequently customers were asking from rarely to frequently was 81%. So the conversation's out there. Just a quick show of hands, who in here is being asked by their customers about what you call electrification, whatever that term means? Okay, so maybe about 10% or less. We also asked, what's the definition? Again, because just like Brian said, that terminology can be challenging, but what does it mean to you as the contractor? And some people talked about fossil fuel conversion, increase in energy efficiency, improvements in indoor air quality, upgrading the home system, electrical system, only using renewables. So it means a lot of things to a lot of people. The other requests were beyond just installing heat pumps, because that seemed to be a core for all the, the respondents. What other things are you considering and actually installing today? Anything else besides heat pumps? What are customers asking about? Weatherization and home performance. We, we also learned, learned the term heat pump ready home, which they use, Kevin, you know they use in, in New York. Uh, heat pump water heaters, solar panels, induction cooking, home batteries, electrical upgrades, et cetera. And then are you installing at least one other product today other than heat pumps? And many of the respondents, and sort of like, you, you don't, you don't fault us, but we'll be acknowledging that we're dipping into a special pool of respondents. But it's significant in the number, and the pool represents people like you 
that are interested in this. Future installations, what else would you like to do in the future? So this is where we're looking for, say, what, what is the business opportunity to serve your customer? And then we'll lead to the point of what do you think is missing? We also act because there's a, there's a huge economic drive in the economy, that's the Inflation Reduction Act. It's not entirely clear for everyone. We were talking about that yesterday. Uh, even with manufacturers, uh, with states, what does that mean? But is that question coming up? And, if, and are you prepared to handle that? So this, this again leads to what I want to get to here, just to finish the presentation. We took these mainly from the 32 interviews, because we had the chance to dialogue with the, the survey respondents. What are the pain points? What are the things, if they were to move in that direction, what do they need? What could be offloaded? What could you use as a service to help you do more work for your customers? Educating customers seemed to be the number one answer. And this actually, this is, these quotes are from the actual interviews. This is the number one. We need non-technical answers to the benefits the customers receive. That sounds like a common theme for the work you do, I'm sure. Uh, just talking with some, just the whole conversation this week has been about trying to get customers on board with doing better work. They don't appreciate it because of number four on the list, competing against low, low cost or contractors that sell at a lower price. Um, I like that like but hate the phrase, the quote, HVC is stuck in a short sales cycle with rip and replace providers that results in a race to the bottom. So what we're looking to do with Duckling, and this is my part-time job, I'm still with TrueTech, don't worry about that, or maybe you'll be happy, but I'm, 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 I'm distracted in this area because of the work I've done in my own home, where I see things are, are moving, and I see the opportunity because I think HVAC contractors deal with so much complexity that covers all the touch points of providing customers with electrified homes. We're, you're already doing the work, and it's a minor extension or an adjacent part of work that could be added, and it's something that could benefit your business and serve your customers who are moving in a certain direction. So with, with that, I want to open up the panel discussion. Thank you for listening to this. So I guess my first, I, I have a, a whole bunch of questions here, but the first thing I want to do is just allow Kimberly to kind of respond to the results. Yeah. Because when I look at this, this slide is the one I want to keep up because it, these are, you know, in, in our own words kind of thing. Um, and so when you think about, you know, some of these top, top things that we, that we mentioned here that are sort of the pain points or the barriers, what are, what are your thoughts on that or what are you seeing or hearing? Uh, can, can I not answer your question and, and just say what you want to say anyway a that's that's good question sure let's do like, that like pretend that you didn't ask that yeah I'll, we'll Sorry. just it never happened i know because <laughs> i want to shake this up a little bit so i i want to i want to take the temperature of the room so when when you hear the term electrification how many people have a positive reaction okay how many people have a negative reaction like, be honest, because, yeah, because that's, like, <laughs> it's okay. How many people get really mad, like, actually makes them angry to hear this term electrification? Okay, we've got some people being really honest here. So I, I, can, I can relate to that, and now I'm going to get back to answering your question, but I want to bookmark. I'll tell you, I'm interested in what makes you all angry or feel negatively towards that term electrification, and I'll share with you in a few minutes from now like what makes me angry about it. So now I'm going to get back to your question, because this is important. I want to know what people are walking in the room with. Like what, what do you want to hear? What, what do you need to say so that we can actually engage in a productive conversation? Because I hate to say it, but electrification, it's happening. Like this is an irreversible trend. And there are good reasons for this irreversible trend. Um, but there are, there are choices being made, there are dictates being made that don't make any sense at all and that are really throwing up people's resistances for, for very good reasons. No so, pun intended. Ah, resistance. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Didn't even know it. 
So is there one on, in particular that you think, like one of these questions in particular? So it was a poorly formed, it was a poorly formed question. Let me Let's reform see. now. Thank Let you. me reform. Okay. So what are some of the things right off the bat that you see that make you angry or that you're seeing oh. uh, that are resulting in frustration uh, from the trade? Can you ask each one of us that question? I'll, I'll ask each one of you that and I'll okay. start with Kimberly. Yes. Okay. Because I'm ready. I'm very ready flexible, as you all can see yeah. here. I'm a very flexible moderator. Thank you. So um, what really frustrates me about the electrification movement right now is that I feel like it's being led by academics. And that drives me nuts. Because uh, it's, it's being led by people in the industry who have excellent intentions and have very smart theoretical ideas and they are so disconnected from the people who are actually going to have to do the work to make that transition happen. And that disconnect results in massive areas of ignorance. <laughs> and, and there's not even enough self-awareness within the groups that are leading the transition to say, I don't, I don't know this. Like, I don't, I don't know enough, actually, about heat pumps. I don't know enough about electrical panels and upgrades. I don't know enough about what kind of electrical load switching an entire neighborhood over to heat pumps from gas furnaces is going to have on this community. So there's not even enough self-awareness to say, I need to assemble a team of critical skill sets that are way outside of my, my my own community, my own comfort zone, um, and and that's not and because of that, it's not happening. That lack of self awareness, so that drives me nuts. That's what makes me angry because this there is a solution, but you can't expect for this to be a successful transition for us to do as well as we could with this if we keep on trying to do business as usual and hand out like marching orders like. It's not going to happen like that. So, that's my answer. Anybody think that was a good answer? Let's give a round of applause to that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bergman. Well, this is what, uh, if you just close your eyes for a minute and you, you relax in this room right now, and you, you guys are all experiencing what improper electrification is going to feel like. <laughs> right? I mean, you just get wearing your sweatshirts, because this is completely possible. I, I'm not going to tell you that electrification is not possible, because I honestly do believe it is possible to do electrification, but not with the skill set our industry currently has. And the biggest problem that we're going to see, in my opinion, is that we, we can't even put an air conditioning systems right. And heat pumps are a whole other skill set and challenge, especially in northern climates, where we have never put a heat pump in before. Uh, Bill will tell you, we had to bring in somebody from Ohio to charge his heat pump in Pennsylvania because we couldn't get the tech, we offered him everything to do the job and to do a proper evacuation on the system. Bill's system, when I went over there and looked at it, I popped the cover off and the acid smell was amazing because they had not done a proper evacuation on the system. And Bill had done everything in his power to get the system installed right, yet there was three heat pumps put in that house before the final one that's in it today. And then, as soon as it got cold, he didn't have his electric heat hooked up right. right? And it's not, this is not a failure of the equipment. The equipment can do everything it's supposed to do. It's a failure of our industry. And this is, honestly, when I say, get used to wearing your sweatshirt. If we flip the switch to electrification today, this is, this is what we'd feel like, or even worse. I'm a huge advocate for hybrids. I think uh, the way that we should be doing this is the hybrid system, uh, especially in the northern climates. We should, cars should be hybrid, and homes should be hybrid. And we should move into this slowly and learn how these systems work and then eventually get people moved off. The problem is, with hybrids, in my opinion, is you're still paying the cost of having the gas connected to your house. And so this is what I was going over with Nate. I'm like, Nate, I'm not seeing any savings with this heat pump. And he said, well, that's because you haven't disconnected your gas meter yet. 
and until you disconnect the gas meter, you're going to have the, just the cost of having the, the line at your home. And so it, but, but it's enabled me to test the technology at my house and see that it, I can actually run my heat pump and be super comfortable. And where I really save money is on the air conditioning side. It does an amazing job with the air conditioning. But this is not without challenges. And the biggest challenge that we have, the, by far the biggest challenge we have is our, our skill set as technicians is not there yet to be successful with this at mass, at mass, at mass adoption. We're just not there. Bill? Good, well put, yeah. Jim. So, so I'm angry about the fact that people get angry and stay angry and, and don't look at it like opportunity. Because Jim just talked about the ability and Kimberly, you know, the equipment is there, is, is ready. The skills, techniques are lacking. And what are you here for? Why did you come this week? People, sit, people on, online, people sitting here, you came to learn to improve your skill set. Again, I'm, I'm angry that people get angry and stay angry and don't look at it like opportunity. It's a hard problem, but I want to be part of the solution. That, that's... In, like Brian said, I share openly on a Facebook page, mostly, Spone Home, doc, Spone Home Facebook group, 650, 700 members. I'll share things almost every day, every week at least, about what's going on my solar production, when the inverters go down, uh, when the heat pump isn't keeping up, when the system's shutting down. Uh, now I've got a weather station there to look at wind and, and other things going on, but. I'm, I'm all into it, I'm, and I, I try to say, like, I'm, I'm trying to bring the house of the future into today's world to play with it, to go through some hardship, but for the common good and the benefit of moving this industry forward. And, and I'll say skating to the electron, because that, that's where everything is, is trending, uh, the tendencies are. Uh, let's be part of the future. All right, everybody got one clap. No more clapping until the end, okay? Because otherwise we're just going to clap the whole time. Yeah. Well, I, I did start warm, it. I did Brian. start it. Yeah, right. I did start it. That's true. Started that's his true. hand rubbing, and now it's turned to clapping. Yeah, that's good. Can I bring up another point that's Absolutely. really important? Um, so there's a huge difference between new construction all-electric home and a retrofit all-electric home. And, and we have to be really careful about make, drawing that line because it's, um, it's darn, it's very difficult to switch a poorly built home with very little insulation, high infiltration, um, to switch that, especially in a cold climate, from a gas furnace to a heat pump and not increase operational costs and also not run the risk of hitting a critical weather event and, and freezing out your, your clients. So it's important to be really commonsensical. So I agree with Jim that definitely with, with existing structures, dual fuel systems only make sense. Um, I think when we're talking about new construction, and if you're building it from the outset with really low loads, like, and this has got to be part of the plan and part of the solution, is that every new building that we bring online, it's either going to be an asset or a liability. And, and it should be an asset just out of the gate, which means it should be really low load, it should be resilient to weather events that we can't control. And, and you can, in these cases, if that's, how you're, if that's how you're designing and that's how you're actually executing, you can go all electric. And, and even up into northern climates, this is another point I want to make, there, not all heat pumps are created equal. There are cold climate heat pumps that can maintain 100% capacity down to negative 5, negative 10 degrees. You just have to, you have to choose the right equipment. You have to size it properly for your design conditions. Um, so those exist, but they're not all created equal. But that is a totally different scenario than having uh, an existing structure that's poorly insulated, high infiltration, 
and just swapping, you know, swapping in a heat pump for a gas furnace. Like, that could be dangerous, and it's also difficult on the grid. So that's one of those commonsensical things that drives me nuts, because it's like, well, you can't just throw a bunch of heat pumps into New York State, right, without truly upgrading the building envelope. So though I work for a heat pump manufacturer, and I do believe they're part of the solution, we've got to get better at working together with weatherization contractors and with designers to, to do things like, I, I'm in Texas, I have an uninsulated, vented attic, that's where my air handler is. It's cr crazy temperature differences in the winter and in the summertime, so it makes no sense. So the retrofit I'm doing, you know, like walking the talk, is, is doing exterior insulation. I have to replace my shingles, putting exterior insulation at the roof line to get that into condition space. I don't like spray foam, that's just me. So, but these are the kinds of holistic solutions that we have to be thinking about, you know, for existing structures. Uh, Great, yeah, great answers. Um, and a lot of these questions, I think, th that, that we got um, are kind of assuming that everybody is super rah rah pro full bore electrification. So, um, you know, take that, take some of that with a grain of salt. But uh, but people are looking for advice and are struggling. So I, I'm going to go with kind of a, a simple one um, from Eric Farron. He asked, as a person who is in a primarily gas furnace market and gas is cheap, can you explain to me how switching to a heat pump will be better for the customer as far as utility costs go. I just have a hard time wrapping my head around it. So I'll, I'll give that to Bill first. Yeah. This isn't going to happen everywhere all at once. But I, I think there's an inevitability of the increase in energy costs. And, and some of the um, existing construction retrofits or remodels or upgrades I like to think of those or preach those as permanent investments. They're one time, and they're, they're insulation or, or, or protection against, you're hedging against future price increases. So if you can get it right, you start saving this year, next year, but it, it may make sense for, your, for your, um, your clients. It may not. It may make sense in your area. It may not. Uh, we, we talked to some people in the interview who are with a, a rural electric association in uh, central southern Washington state, and they're at, Kevin, brace yourself, seven cents a kilowatt hour. We talked with some other people who are 31 to 39 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. And that seven cent area, that's not going to make sense right now to do. But I, I, I want you to keep your eyes open for opportunity. So I, I want to answer the question, I think it's very important. Like, if you're in a gas market, how are you going to save money? Like, yeah. in Kevin's market, here, here's how you save money, uh, honestly, how you save money, is when you look at things like a steam boiler, right? A steam boiler, if you looked at the rating of it, it's 80% efficient. And it's 80% efficient when it's running and producing steam, right? So it, it's not 80% efficient when it first starts. When it first starts, it's producing no steam, right? And it runs for probably 15 to 20 minutes before it starts to generate steam. Those are called dynamic losses. So here's how you save money in a heat pump market. You put mini split heat pumps in a home with a steam boiler and you use it in the shoulder season when your boiler is actually about 50, 30 to 50% efficient. Because the boiler, when it hits peak load, when it's cold enough outside, when it's zero, the boiler is 80% efficient, it's gonna heat the home just fine. But if we use a heat pump in the shoulder season to eliminate that what's called dynamic losses of the boiler, so when the boiler would be cycling, when it needs like you know, a, a heat for a short time. So the boiler comes up, it gets heat. It, it takes 20, 30 minutes to make heat, but then it overshoots the house temperature because now it's, it's uh, too much heat in the radiators. We get the huge swings. We can eliminate all that with heat pumps in the shoulder season. This goes back to the hybrid system. So if you want to save money, you save a huge amount. Of, your boiler's 30 to 50% efficient in the fall and the spring. It's 80% efficient in the winter when it's at peak load. Get rid of the dynamic losses. The other thing we should do is completely, I'm a big proponent of completely eliminating air conditioning systems. Every one that's sold should be a heat pump. We should, because the shoulder season's where you save the money. And the shoulder season's where heat pumps work and work very, very well. And then we just go to the, uh, when we need the, um, you know, the, the peak demand, then we keep the existing heating system in. I mean, it's that simple. And then we go back to things like, 
Again, steam boilers are awesome if you have the right controls on them. We gotta, we gotta learn how these things, Dan Houlihan will tell you, the people that knew how these things worked are dead. And if we just went back and learned how, like about vapor stats and, instead of pressure stats and, and learned how to uh, optimize furnace operation. 90 plus furnaces, I was in a class the other day and 16 out of 16 people had never clocked a meter on a gas furnace. You can take a 97% efficient furnace and make it into a 90% efficient furnace by simply not getting the fuel input right and getting it into condensing mode. So there's, there's, you can save money in a northern climate by going to a heat pump. Every air conditioner should be a heat pump and just used during the shoulder season where we can save the money on the, on the dynamic losses. Any, any other thoughts on that? No, it covers it? All right. So interesting, interesting idea though. So uh, I'm just gonna ask this as a question then because Jim just gave a very big idea which sounds regulatory to me. Somebody, it's well, our, I, I said you gave a big idea. I didn't say okay. you created a big idea. Make... Work on listening, <laughs> listening skills. He didn't want to take credit again. <laughs> again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a that's a big idea. The big idea is all right. No more no more air conditioners. Everything's got to be a heat pump. What are your thoughts? Kimberly? Thirty bucks. It's all cost. Well, <laughs> I mean, yes, I agree with that. I mean, I I also think we have to be uh, realistic about about people's budgets, you know, and about emergency replacement situations and to look at the very real um, supply issues that most manufacturers have had. So um, I would say yes within reason and yes we should be uh, proactively replacing systems when it makes sense. Now the most unsustainable thing you can do is to take a system that's actually functioning and working and throwing it out. Like that's, that's another thing that, that really frustrates me is that, you know, for where I, I believe strongly in, in, in the responsible use of resources. But that includes like the, a resource is like all of the embodied energy that went into making another coil or condenser. So throwing out a piece of equipment that's actually functioning reasonably well doesn't necessarily make sense in that, that scenario. But if you know that you've gotten that warning from your, you know, your technician that you, your system is definitely on its last leg, like we've limped it along one more summer, then, then maybe pro proactively, yeah, you replace it. Yeah. Good. Um, just, just a thought to springboard off that uh, Kimberly mentioned emergency replacement, and that tends to happen when the uh, when the weather goes to the extremes. Yeah. Uh, in the the rest of the time, I'm taking a, a branch off of that, but work towards consumers who want to do electrification, like EV chargers, heat pump water heaters, other things, want to move in that direction, that can be scheduled during the shoulder season, the non-busy part of the year, can help you level, level your workload, level your business income, level your staffing. So there's an opportunity there. It's a concept, which I've heard over the years many times. I want you to consider that too. And I would care to add to that, that electrification will never work unless we fix duct leakage. Mm -hmm. That's the other giant, giant um, elephant in the room we don't talk about a lot, but uh, uh, ducts outside the conditioned space and duct leakage are going to make this uh, Im impossible. And I don't think a lot of us appreciate how much duct systems leak. And I think that's uh, one of the most overlooked things in our industry. Uh, I think, you know, this uh, last year working with TEC on, um, on the true flow grid and working with MeasureQuick and the frustrations that we had like we're trying to get the air, we, we couldn't, we always thought there's something wrong with our calculations. And we would go through and recheck things and measure quick and recheck things in tech. And literally it took us almost a month to figure out, all we had to do was call Steve and he told us, but that, <laughs> that, uh, that it was all duct leakage issues. And when we figured, I mean, literally when you figure out a screw hole, one screw hole in a, in a duct work is one CFM. And you look at how many CFM of duct leakage we have, it just makes this, again, another uh, impossible thing to do unless we start properly installing systems, 
seal the duct systems up, make and, and do things like aero seal. I'm a big proponent of aero seal uh, on the systems, a big proponent of mastic, and a big proponent of keeping the, the ducts inside the envelope because it, to me it's a, it's a crazy thing that we're putting ductwork outside where it's, it's gonna leak all the energy and gain all the energy that, that, that it does, so. What do you think about um, what do you think about manufacturers or distributors um, having better kits of parts for ductwork? That you know, th there are a few um, there are a f there are a few manufacturers making um, sort of snap in place type of ductwork. I, I, it seems to me that it makes sense that we need more products out there that are, you know, pre-sized, um, pre-gasketed, lock in place kind of systems. Yeah, yeah, I'm look, curious what the, yeah, what the room thinks yeah. about that because it makes sense to me. What? Yeah, any, th any thoughts from the room about some of the existing technologies or, or um, just as, a, just as I, an I, idea in general, something we should move forward? I think you can get any, no matter how good of technology you make, you can put it in the wrong hands and get it screwed up. It really comes down to education more than, we have great products, right? I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the mini split, and um, it's Achilles heel is the flare, right? People, and we've been flaring in this industry, and it, honestly, a good flare joint is stronger than a, a brace joint, period. If you make a flare right, it is stronger than a brace joint. And it's an excellent mechanical connection. For crying out loud, we use them on brake lines and put thousands of PSI on them. We've been using them forever in our industry. And some of it comes down to improper tools. We don't have good tools to make good flares. Some of it comes down to technique. But no matter how, no matter what products we make, unless we're training people to actually do those processes correctly, we're just gonna end up in the same boat. It, it's honestly, training is right now where our biggest problem we have. I just want to add to that, that's a balance between e either put labor, you either spend money on labor, materials, or poor results. So, so there's a, you can use, if there's better materials to use, that upfront cost, cost might be higher, but it's easier to install. Mm -hmm. Or you could use more, more materials and more labor to do it, or you could pay for it on the back end when it doesn't work and you're getting called back or you get a dissatisfied customer, et cetera. So just, just look cool, at the though. full economic picture when, when you look at things, don't just buy the cheapest materials. As I look at the kind of the questions that were submitted, a lot of them fall into this kind of standard electrification question bucket, which is about like, well, what do you think about how the grid is going to be able to handle it? What do you think? Well, like, what, what are the answers? I would rather us focus on things right now that we could maybe do something about or start to think differently about. So I want you all to ask questions, raise your hands, but I'm going to ask the first question because I, because to me, this seems like the most obvious. Mm. What about energy banking? What about using buffer tanks for, for heat energy storage or you know, a hot for heat storage and using ice banking for uh, you know, kind of low temperature BTUs? What are, what are your thoughts on that? Because that to me seems like the easiest way to kind of get where we're, where we're headed. I think for commercial projects, we're going to see more of those designs. Absolutely, and it, and it makes sense. We need, more, we, need, we need more thermal storage options and probably some commercialized thermal storage options. So I say yes. But why not in residential? Uh, maybe for some of the reasons that, that we've pointed out, that it's just there are so many more projects and there's so much, um, there's so much less uh, resources put towards the design and coordination phase of that. So it, it would have to be really more plug and play to make it, um, a reliable solution and also profitable for the installing contractors. And where are you going to put it? Physical space. Yeah, physical space, space. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you going to put it? And who's going to want that? You know, they don't. Yeah. That's where everything should go. Everything belongs in the attic. So Jim, I was really struck by your comment about the workforce needs and training. And I've been really impressed by everybody who's here, and this is like the cutting edge of people who want to learn. I, you know, I'm doing survey work. Um, a lot of what I hear feedback on, people don't want to get trained. So how are we going to fix that problem? 
So, I mean, if you think about it, there's about 760,000 uh, technicians in the industry today. And so we have uh, less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the market here that's actually, um, you know, getting trained and, and, and excited about this. I, I think there's some opportunities to, to, to fix things with, with technology, but, but I don't know that there's like an easy answer for this. I mean, it's, it's got to be voluntary. It's got to be taking pride in your work. It's, 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 I think what's going to happen, honestly, is we'll, as we go to the electrification and people feel like we feel in this room right now, cold and miserable, that it's going to, um, that it's gonna, it's, it's, it's gonna, the consumer's gonna drive it. They're not gonna put up with it. There's gonna be, they're gonna eventually be willing to pay money to have people come in and do good work at their homes because, um, you know, it, it's right now, it's a race to the bottom with pricing because when energy's cheap, um, you can do a sub-quality installation and the consumer, they have, they have no, they have no, nothing to measure it against. They don't know what it would cost to operate their home if, if the install was done right, if, the, you know, if, the, if it was a quality installation. They have no idea. They, they get a $200 bill and they think, well, that's just what it costs to cool my home. They don't realize it could be a $30 bill. But when you start doing this in, in, in mass and people aren't comfortable and utility costs are high and you get a lot of public outcry, that, then I think it's gonna end up in regulatory and people are gonna be, you know, and, and people be required to do some things and that's, that's really like if you think back when we did CFC certifications, initially it, it weeded out a lot of the dead weight in our industry because people just left because they're like, I'm not going to deal with this, right? And that's probably what's going to happen again is we're going to have an exodus of people that are, are, um, are the bottom feeders in our industry. But I don't think there's an easy answer. I honestly don't. I have an answer. <laughs> Well, we've had standards like, you know, ACA, the guys at ACA have been building standards. We've been building standards as an industry forever, but they're all voluntary, right? And so, um, you know, we're trying to like, with Measure Quick right now, we're trying to bring people awareness that there's standards and that they need to be following the standards and this is how we get the results. This is, this is how electrification is possible if we actually follow the standards that are already in our industry. But if, if we have a, a tremendous number of people that aren't even aware that standards exist. Chad will tell you, uh, with, um, he's with uh, Stimson and HVAC. He just sat down with some of his technicians last week and he, he said, he thought at first Measure Quick was a problem. He's like, this just takes way too long. Then he realized his technicians were the problem. And he realized that he had, had been a long time since he had read a furnace manual or an install manual on a piece of equipment. And they sat down with their technicians and read the installation manuals. So one of his guys said he's been in the industry for 30 years and he's never read an install manual on a piece of, a piece of equipment. And he was like, well, this is pretty interesting. I didn't realize there's all these facets. How do you fix that? How do you fix, you know, we're, we're an industry of mechanics. We can mechanically get all this stuff hooked together, but none of it works right. We don't, you know, Brian's a unicorn, the fact that he, uh, he's, a, he's a reader. I mean, he was homeschooled and he's a reader. A lot of us are public education and that wasn't the most exciting thing in the world to do, right? And we got into the trades because we didn't want to read, we didn't want to do math, we wanted to work with our hands and hook stuff up. So now you got this, this gap, this skills gap, huge skills gap, where people need to be, have better math skills, better reading skills, better technology skills in general, and, but we don't have a workforce that's prepared for that. When you're homeschooled, reading is the only thing there is to do. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> what else is there? Go ahead, Kimberly, you had some. Well, I think, I, 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 agree with, I agree with what Jim's saying, and I also think that we've got to get, we've got to get our heads above the clouds a little bit, and we've got to realize that this is a very broad and deep problem. And in order to effectively address it, to me, it looks like we have to capture people's imaginations. We have to capture their hearts and their passions. We have to get people to tap into their own inherent motivations to do better. And so part of that is just, and I'd say broadly, like in media, in, you know, in our movies, in our personal interactions, we have to start telling stories that means something to us. And we have to start casting heroes um, differently. We've got to, I don't care, 
if you're a homesteader, if you're a Greenpeace member and you care about sustainability, like actually these are all different facets of the same stone. And that is you, you care about resources and using them well. And, and we need to start telling these stories that capture the imaginations of all of us so that we want to do better, so that we want to read that manual, we want, we're willing to take that test, sit in the chair you know, for a class. Um, and, in, and people do better when they, they believe that they can do better and that when they believe that they can contribute to a problem and make a difference. And so part of that, I think, is just human nature. Like, we've always told stories. They've, they've been important in, in motivating people, inspiring people, and in, 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 um, in tapping us into our deeper selves. Well, and that's what, that's what we've got to, I think, start doing better, a better job at. Um, yeah. So, so when is HVAC the movie coming out? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. And is George Clooney going to play me? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think um, Walter White or, you know, uh, you, you should be paid by uh, the, the mad Heis Heisenberg over here. Yeah. So one of the challenges that I had as a contractor in trying to implement el electrification is that you've got a, an 80 or 90 percent furnace with an air conditioning. It's the middle of summer, middle of winter, and it breaks down. You need to provide a, a solution quick. But electrification, a cold weather heat pump, you got to replace the line set because the liquid line's got to get, or the liquid line, the small line's got to get insulated. The MOCP value of the outdoor unit is a lot higher, so now you got to get an electrician to run a new home run. There was five conductor wire going to the thermostat and two conductor wire going to the AC. I've got to replace the thermostat wire, mm -hmm. and that makes it cost prohibitive for the typical family on a budget to switch over. So my question is, how can we make a cold weather heat pump outdoor unit with a coil or an air handler where the MOCP is 30 amps for a three ton unit? How can we make a wireless interface between all of those things with a thermostat where we don't, I mean, look, wireless technology is here. There's no reason why we need to be pulling eight conductor wires all over a house anymore. Can Mitsubishi implement that to make it easier for contractors to implement electrification and, and not have to break the bank of some poor family that's just trying to get their air conditioning going in the yeah. middle of July? I, I hear you, and it's a very, it's, it's a well-taken question. Um, I can tell you we're working on it. You know, why can't we? Well, I could, I, um, so, yeah, peeking behind the curtain a little. Like, you, you take a company like Mitsubishi Electric. They're a global company. They're serving many different markets. There are other global markets that are way ahead of the U.S. market, and the U.S. has actually been getting the leftovers from a lot of the product design from other, other markets for, them for, for decades now. So we are working on that. We're working on exactly, exactly the, that checklist that you just named, like being able to reuse line sets, not having to rerun wire, being able to, you know, hopefully not having to upgrade your panel. But, but that being said, like some of those things, you know, you might get two out of three, you might get one out of three. Like if we want to upgrade infrastructure, that means some of the infrastructure is going to have to be upgraded and there's not, I can't promise that we're going to be able to check all of those off, but yeah, that's going to be a challenge. I mean, why does a more efficient heat pump have a higher MOCP than a 12 seer air conditioner? Well, I have to. I have. The, so you're talking about one of my favorite topics, Tim. You know this. So you don't size the conductor based on MOCP. You size it based on MCA. The MCA is higher in some cases, but not always so much higher. So a lot of times we're running new conductors when we don't need to. It depends on it depends on the Celsius rating of the conductor that's being pulled. Is it NM cable? Is it so like this is an education thing as well. I'm not I know you know all this, so you 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 know this, but a lot of people don't. And so some a lot of times you don't have to run a new circuit just because the majority of technicians believe that you have to size the conductor to the breaker and you absolutely do not. Uh, as part of the National Electrical Code. So there's things like that as well that, that play into this. Um, I want everybody to go ahead and just, because uh, we're already, we're over time now, we're done. But I want you to go ahead and just kind of, final statement, wrap it up. Um, this is, we did not schedule enough time for this, I apologize. Um, so what are kind of your final words, final thoughts? So we'll start with uh, 
Start with Bill, and then we'll go Jim and then Kimberly. Don't get angry and stay angry. Get involved. Uh, lead or look to encourage your leadership to change. And I'm just talking about electrification. I'm talking about everything. And if you want to learn more, stop by the True Tech booth. We're actually looking for more contractors to get more feedback, more engagement. Please come by and learn some more. If this stimulates your thinking. I don't expect to reach everyone here, but I'm seeing some head nodding. That's all. Jim? Uh, my final thought is you can have my furnace when you pry it out of my cold, dead hands. <laughs> Nobody wants your furnace, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> They're coming for our furnaces. Yeah, right. Democrats. <laughs> that's a joke. Kimberly? Well, that's really my final thought. Yeah, no, I know. I, I know. That, that's it. Right. I, no, I knew. Yeah, I could tell. I could tell. Are you sure you're done? I am. <laughs> All right. He's never done. He's never done. <laughs> so I, my final thought is just thank you. Um, I, I agree with Bill. I think, I think you should get angry if you feel angry, but then, but then use that energy. That's energy. And, and believe that there are people out here, you know, on this side of the table who want to hear your input, um, and let's work together on the solution. Um, we're here to listen and work with you. Thank you so much. Big thanks to my friends Kimberly, Bill, and Jim for doing this. Uh, they are pillars of the HVAC community and people who I really look up to and respect. To find this session and all the other sessions that were at the symposium this year, go to hvacrschool.com slash symposium. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.